<laughs> so, welcome. Thank you everybody for coming. It's really awesome to see some of the Net Tuesday folks that I've seen before and a whole bunch of political folks, even Green Party folks. Um, welcome to Learning from a Loss. Uh, after the disappointing defeat a couple years ago, or last year, it <laughs> feels like a couple of years ago, and many a beer dissecting the loss, uh, a few of us started to talk about some of the lessons that we thought should come out of the election, good, bad, and otherwise, because for all the effort that people put into it, it seemed a shame to sort of set everything aside and not learn from it. And I think that some of the best uh, lessons you can learn come out of when you fail. So as introduced, uh, my name is Michael Roy. I'm the Director of Communications over at the BCNDP. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mike L. Roy. And when I was looking for a good way to explain failure, this was the first quote I came across. Trying is a step, first step towards failure. Thank you, Homer Simpson. But put another way, um, failing is a crucial step to building success. And in looking at the results of the election, what we did well, what we did poorly, what we need to do next time, I think looking at lessons from a loss are a lot more valuable in a lot of ways than looking at a success. Because in a success, it's hard to um, evaluate what didn't work. Whereas in a loss, you can be a lot more critical about things that didn't work and things that did and uh, what lessons to take out of that. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you guys through three lessons that we, or at least I think, were successes of ours, and also three that were failures out of the campaign. Um, I think there were lessons in both. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, why we lost the election. That, that's been written about at length. Uh, maybe after a couple of beers later on, we'll see, but uh, yeah, I'm leaving that aside. I want to go into some of the things we learned that are constructive and that we can use uh, in future campaigns, and hopefully some of you guys can use on uh, in electoral politics, uh, in the not-for-profit world, in the digital campaigning world, in the advocacy world. So, um, to start with, um, obviously this campaign in uh, 2013 was well into the age of social media. Uh, you know, this, this wasn't, we were pioneering, uh, you know, online campaigning, you know, uh, the, the role of web, of Twitter, of Facebook, of email, these are all very well established uh, in, in the political world through uh, a number of campaigns. Uh, two elections previous, 2005, I mean, back then, uh, Facebook was a year old, uh, Twitter didn't exist yet, YouTube would, had started two months before the campaign began. I mean, we all know the stories about how campaigning has changed over the last eight or ten years. I mean, Facebook celebrating its tenth birthday this year was really weird for me. Um, but, uh, you know, two elections later, uh, these are sort of well-established um, tools that we all work with from day to day. Uh, so we weren't uh, so much trying to figure out how to use these for the first time so much as how to use them effectively. Having seen uh, provincially, federally, municipally in the United States, other campaigns use these tools to varying effect, we looked at how do we do this well in a way that supports the work of the campaign? And what we came up with was that on the social front, we needed to do three things. We needed our content to be fresh, we needed it to be engaging, and we needed it to be fast, and underline fast here. What we knew was that in a digital world where reporters were breaking stories on Twitter as the words were uttered, uh, before they even put their minds to print articles or the new news, uh, we knew that we had to get announcements and content out really, really quickly. And so we geared a lot of our digital campaigning around that, around how can we get content out fast. We're competing with global TV and CBC, uh, our opponents, and we needed to deliver um, written content, uh, graphic content, and video content as quickly as possible. Now, there was another challenge that we wanted to address on the digital front, which was that over the last 10 years, newsrooms have been shrinking. Smaller budgets in, uh, in, in all sorts of news organizations, print, TV, radio, uh, have led to fewer staff, uh, fewer reporters covering more stories, and we wanted to look at ways that we could leverage what we were doing in the social media universe to help get our message to reporters across the province. We wanted to put content in their hands, uh, whether that was a photo pool or video clips for TV stations that couldn't make it out to events. So we knew going into the campaign as we began to plan that our days were fairly simple. Most days uh, started with a morning policy announcement, uh, the leader of the party announcing our healthcare platform or a policy on affordability or whatnot. Uh, we knew that in the afternoon there would be sort of a, an out and about in the community event, maybe visiting a cafe or a senior's home, and probably a rally in the evening. It meant that we had a sort of cyclical approach around which we could build our days. But mostly they, they were built off of that morning uh, policy announcement, the real meat of the campaign. And so as we started to focus on, on our, our major mediums, on email, on Twitter, on our blog, uh, share graphics and video, 
um, we started to ask ourselves, how can we do this really quickly? Obviously, we know what the announcement is. It's, you know, it's, pre it's pre written the day before, a week before, whatever. But how do we get the images? How do we get the photos? How do we get the video? Uh, how do we get the, the, the engaging content? Um, so one of the things we did is we set out to see, like, we didn't have a TV station budget, but we said to ourselves, how do we get video back from the field uh, from a 10 a.m. press announcement back to our editor uh, at the campaign, edited and out onto YouTube in two or three hours on a, a TV station sort of schedule? We didn't have a satellite truck. We didn't have any of that high-end broadcast technology. And so we came across this. You can sort of see in that little box at the top there. Um, it's called a, a Teradek unit, and it's this company out of the U.S. that built this little tiny add-on that let us transmit live HD video over the cellular network. And to rent it for four weeks was just a couple of thousand bucks, and that let us get, uh, record live everything that was happening out in the field, which gave us the raw video from which to put together news clips uh, that we could post every day. Um, this is their sort of like technical explanation with all the bits and pieces. I don't, like our IT guys understood this, I didn't. But uh, essentially, it got video back from the field. And what that let us do is it meant that the moment uh, the leader stopped speaking every day, we had a recording that we could then turn around and post to YouTube uh, and distribute to news outlets who couldn't make it out to Kelowna or Penticton or wherever we happened to be campaigning that day. Uh, a lot of outlets just no longer had the resources to send a camera and a reporter. And it meant that we could email them raw video to do a news story that day. And so you know, building on that, uh, we, uh, we, we started turning these things around. And one of the things we found was that um, the quicker we posted content, the more engaged our audience was. So there were times, for example, where we'd run into like, you know, a technical problem, uh, interference, or we'd be somewhere with bad cell coverage, that sort of thing. And we'd eventually get the video back from that day and post it. But we found that when we posted, you know, the difference between posting something at one in the afternoon on the day of an announcement and the following morning significantly reduced our engagement rates. Fewer likes, fewer shares, fewer comments, those sort of things. Um, and, and I mean, it reinforced that message, that premise that we went into the campaign with, which was that timeliness matters, speed matters. Um, in, by the end of the campaign, we'd released 34 videos in 28 days. Uh, for a total of about 400,000 uh, non-paid views on YouTube, which, uh, you know, I was pretty blown away by. I didn't think that there was that much interest in sort of the, the meat and potatoes of campaign content, but it proved that this theory that uh, getting things out quickly matters, speed matters. We applied the same sort of thinking to photos. We, we had a photographer out on the, the, the campaign tour, and we, we gave him two missions. One was we wanted to make pool photos available to news outlets that couldn't afford uh, to, to buy their photos from CP or from a wire photographer uh, for free. And secondly, we wanted those photos for promotional materials, for Facebook, for that sort of thing. Um, so we looked around at what technology was out there, you know, how, how did the Newswire guys do this? And we realized that it really wasn't that hard. In fact, like, I could do it with my little cheesy VSLR that I have at home. Um, we grabbed a wireless, uh, a Wi-Fi, an iFi card, they're called, uh, and an iPad, and linked the two up with a little free piece of software. And what we were able to do is, as our photographer shot, all of his photos were, were dumped into a Dropbox automatically and uploaded. And within about five or six minutes of a photo being snapped, we had a low-resolution copy back at our office in Burnaby that we could start to edit and get online and add some content to and share. And again, we saw exactly the same thing. On days when this worked, which was most of the time, uh, we saw far higher response and engagement rates for stuff we shared. On days when we waited, the engagement rates were much lower. And it really just underlined that speed matters. And so, I mean, that, that's sort of our first lesson of the campaign, that, key, that speed is a key metric when it comes to coverage and engagement. How quickly you get content out really does matter. So moving right along, um, challenge number two. We, uh, sorry, uh, go back. Our next challenge was around uh, voter contact. And for folks here who are not sort of up on uh, the latest, well, it's not even the latest, it's been around for quite a while, uh, sort of electoral strategy. Um, during an election campaign, there's sort of two major components that happen, really broadly speaking. One is the so-called air war, the news, the advertisements, getting your message out, that sort of thing. The second is the so-called ground game, and uh, this has become sort of a lot more prominent and, uh, and trendy in, in recent years. Uh, it's a strategic approach to talking to voters one-on-one, -on -one, largely done by volunteers, knocking on doors, making phone calls, and individually persuading people to vote for you. And, and this, this component of the campaign sort of has two phases. First off, you identify your supporters. You knock on a bunch of doors, you say, 
hey, Elijah, are you going to vote NDP in this election? Oh, that's great. Did you have any questions? That's awesome. And you go, okay, Elijah's voting for us. That's, that's fantastic. And then step two on election day is making sure that Elijah, with his busy schedule and all the stuff he has to do, actually gets to... I'm really flaky. <laughs> and, and this is why we, we, we do this, is for folks like you who are busy, to make sure you get out to vote. And this is the theory. You identify your supporters, and then you get them to the polls. And it, it's based on the premise that if you can identify enough supporters uh, to match the number of votes you likely need to win based on previous election results, and then you get them to the polls, then, in theory, you win. Uh, at least you win that seat. <laughs> now, one of our challenges was around the technology we used to do this. Um, knocking on the door is the easy part. Keeping track of who you've knocked, who you need to go back to, who's not supporting you, who is supporting you, that's the real challenge. There are a million and a half registered voters in the province, and a heck of a lot more, more non-registered voters, and methodically going door to door in 85 constituencies is a massive undertaking. And so about 10 years ago, well, historically, this was done with paper copies of the voters list and pencils and photocopiers. And I'm sure everybody here is going, oh my god, how the on earth do you do that? I wonder the same thing. This was before my time. But about 10 years ago, at least in the NDP, we started to use this, uh, this hacked together Microsoft Access database called NDP Vote. And at the time, it was lovely. It was new technology. 10 years later, it's a little bit long in the tooth. And going into this election, um, we had a real challenge. We said to ourselves, like, look, we'd love a replacement for this. You know, we were looking at what the Americans are doing, what the federal liberals and federal conservatives are doing, and we're saying, like, we, we need to update our technology. This is a bit out of date. Um, Access has this drawback where the database can only have 100,000 records, and most constituencies have 50,000 voters. So for us, that means every individual candidate needed their own individual, separate, non-talking-to-each-other database. In a perfect world, we would have loved to just replace the system wholesale. But as I'm sure you can imagine, on a few months' development time and a tight, tight budget, building a major database like this uh, was a non-starter. There was no possibility of succeeding at a, at a project that scale on a tight timeline. So we asked ourselves, how else can we do this? And we looked at augmenting uh, the technology we used. So first off, um, our team, and actually Dan Pollock, who's the organizer of uh, Net Tuesday in, uh, in Vancouver, was a guy who led the team who built these tools. Um, the first thing he did was said, well, we've got a whole lot of demographic data. We've got data on previous elections. How can we make this available to volunteers, to activists, and campaign offices across the province so they can look at income data from StatsCan, at age, at home ownership, at any of the, the publicly available data uh, that we get from the census? And he went out and built this tool that I want to show you really, really quickly. I forgot to load it up. Um, he built this tool, this mapping tool. Um, sorry, give me one sec. Here we go. So what he did, we said, like, look, there, there's a lot of mapping products out there. They're very expensive. They're used for GIS, for you know, municipal land management, for all kinds of applications. But they were brutally expensive and would have taken months and months to implement. And we said, well, we've got the raw data. It's pretty publicly available. We've got a programmer. And we've got the Google Maps API, which is also publicly available. What can we do to roll these things together in a couple of weeks? And Dan sat down and built us this tool. Um, let me grab, just because it's where we are today. We grab a constituency. So let's say Vancouver. I think we're in Mount Pleasant right now. I might be. It might be False Creek. I can't remember. Um, anyways, here's Vancouver, uh, Mount Pleasant. Let's see if I can find where we are. Um, but basically, using existing off-the-shelf tools, Google Maps, some readily, readily available public data, previous election results, and a bit of programming know-how. Um, Dan, in about two and a half or three weeks, built this tool from scratch. And the idea was, we, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to take existing off-the-shelf products that we could modify in an easy way and make this available to activists in the field. And what this meant was that we could take uh, different data sets, uh, electoral data or demographic data, and let folks explore it. Let them look at previous election results. These are the 2009 uh, election results up on the screen. Um, look at 
housing, for example, a uh, percentage of people who live in apartments, or, or any of the other publicly available statistics, statistics Canada data. Uh, and so Dan developed this, uh, this great tool. And, um, and the fact that he did it in three and a half weeks kind of blew me away for sure. But, uh, but it, was, it was really about solving a simple problem without completely having to reinvent the wheel. There's my play button. So now one of the other problems we had was, you know, I mentioned a moment ago that we had these disparate databases. Every candidate had their own database. They didn't really talk to each other. This is, you know, Microsoft Access. It's a bit kludgy, like my mom's school uses it for report cards and stuff. Um, and we wanted to know what was going on. We wanted statistics. We wanted to do analytics. We wanted to test data to see what was coming back, make sure that uh, we weren't getting bad information, um, and get a sense of what was going on across the province. Now, obviously, if you had to pull a result every night from 85 databases, that was pretty insane. And replacing the entire system wasn't an option. So again, we looked at what we could do really, really simply. And what we realized was we could harvest the raw data out of every database every night, just a quick nightly snapshot of access data. It's not really that hard to do with a bit of scripting. And then we could dump that into a central uh, MySQL database. And that's exactly what we did. So our team built a, a really quick hacked uh, script in a couple of days that grabbed all the data every night and created a, a nightly snapshot that served both as a backup and as a raw nightly time index pool that we could sort of examine and watch trends over the course of the campaign. Um, In-house, we called it the cross tabs. I, I don't really know where the name came from. I think it was because you could overlay different data sets to, to explore them. But the idea was, since we couldn't build a province-wide data system, we could build something quick and simple using existing infrastructure that would let us uh, look at our data, let, it examine it, let us examine it. And once we had it in there, of course, we could load it into simple analytical tools that were available either online or, or downloadable tools that would let us start to look at, at trends over time, at uh, how many supporters we were identifying, possibly at what issues they were interested in, those sort of things. Um, and this is another example of how we sort of took uh, off-the-shelf technology and adapted it uh, rather than having to you know, rebuild the entire system. Um, now for what it's worth, this was the first time we'd done anything on this scale. Uh, it was a really big data undertaking. Um, creating a massive province-wide time index database was, uh, uh, was a bit of an accomplishment. And we also we weren't entirely sure what to do with it. We were learning as we went. This was a bit of new territory for us. Um, you know, we were talking about huge numbers of records every night. And, and over the course of the campaign, we learned how to analyze them. We learned uh, a little bit about what trends to look for. But we still have a lot more to learn because this was our first outing. Um, and whether or not we'll have this in the next election, I mean, things change. But for us, it was, it was a success insofar as... Um, we, this was one of many tools that helped us identify a whole lot more supporters than the 2009 election. In fact, we identified 50% more supporters across the province. That obviously didn't translate into electoral victory, but it certainly upped our approach in terms of our ground game, our door knocking, our phone calls, and talking to voters one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and it was certainly a success in terms of a learning experience for us. And I mean, the, the lesson, both for the mapping tool and for the analytics tool that I want to impart to you guys is, when time or money are short, be adaptive, creative, and flexible. We couldn't build an entire new system, but we could build a bunch of smaller ones using off-the-shelf technology, things that were widely available, well-documented, and free, most importantly. Um, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, and we didn't, and I think, I, I think that was one of our successes during the campaign. So I'm gonna move on to fundraising for a minute. Um, we are an entirely donor-funded organization. How many people here, just out of curiosity, how many people here work for a, a donor-funded not-for-profit? Okay, so, so a few of you guys are going to kind of know what I'm talking about here. Um, the challenge for us was, you know, over the last number of years, we've seen direct mail revenue and phone fundraising revenue slowly trickle off. People aren't as engaged using, using those methods of giving. And we saw our online fundraising uh, growing exponentially over the last five years. And the challenge for us was, how do we continue to grow and maximize the potential uh, revenue in a short period of time during the election campaign that we could raise through online fundraising? And uh, so what we set out to do was to figure out exactly what, um, what our donor base looked like. Uh, we, we started by segmenting our, our donor base into sort of three distinct groups, uh, and then and we went from there. But the first three groups were people who had previously donated online, people who had previously donated but never given online before, so a, a direct mail donor or a telephone donor, and people who you know, we had contact with, maybe they'd signed a petition or something, but had never made a donation before. And what we did is we went into our group of on previous online donors and said, what do we know about these people? What do we know about where they live, about 
Um, you know, do they live in an NDP area or a liberal area? Um, do they live in a metro or a rural area? Uh, what are their habits? Uh, who's their email provider? And we started to look at these things. Now, in-house, we use a database called Civi CRM to manage uh, our financial operations, uh, donor tracking, uh, donation processing, all of those sort of things. Um, we love it. It's a great open source package that's free. It takes a bit of customization, but, uh, but it does the job for us. And we started to dig through the raw data to sort of look at, you know, what do we know about our online donors? And then using that information, where can we find more online donors? So one of the things we did, this is a, a geographical representation. We hired a statistician and a geographer, and we asked these guys to start telling us what we might know about our donors. So for example, this was one of the first products that our geographer produced. He took all of our donors and their donation amounts and mapped them out and color-coded them. So blue are low donors, uh, yellow, I think it goes green, yellow, orange. So the orange areas are high donation areas. So th this is sort of you know, big parts of the province. Um, and you can sort of see, we, we, it, what it did was it gave us an idea of where our donors were concentrated. And extrapolating from that, one of the things we did with some success was identified other folks in our email database, in our email list, who lived in the same areas if we had a postal code, and said, okay, if you live in an area where there's a lot of other donors, there's a pretty good chance that you're also a prospective donor. And we had some success increasing our online uh, donation conversion rates using this as a starting point. Um, another analysis we did was we all, uh, who here does bulk email? Who here is proud of their open rates? Yeah. I, 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 I feel your pain. Um, we looked at open rate versus conversion rate versus number of emails sent at one time. Uh, and we had our stats guy plot this out and take all of our data going back three years uh, to look at it. And we started to realize that we had higher conversion rates uh, with emails that went to fewer people. In other words, the more you target, the better your, your open rate and the better your conversion rate. In other words, the more people actually donate. And that led us to, rather than doing lar frequent large email blasts, is to do uh, smaller, more targeted asks on a specific issue, to a specific demographic, to uh, any subset of the list that we could come up with that might uh, be interested in donating. Um, we looked at uh, day of the week, found that later days in the week resulted in higher open rates. Um, you know, we also did time of day analysis. We did time of day analysis by part of the province. We basically, we brainstormed a list of about 200 questions and started to try and methodically answer them uh, to look for insights. A lot of them led absolutely nowhere, but by asking these questions, we started to find little nuggets of information that let us refine our approach to fundraising. This was one of my favorites. Uh, it, sorry, it's a bit hard to read, but this is a pie graph of um, each slice represents total online fundraising revenue by domain names, so Shaw and Telus are on the left, and Gmail and other and Yahoo are on the right. And what this did for us is as we, um, we run our own mail server in a house because Civi CRM, it, it doesn't use third party uh, mail systems like MailChimp. Um, and what it let, let us do was uh, refine our email delivery speed. So our sysadmins could go in using this and say, okay, um, Telus is a huge amount of our donor base, but they tend to hold our emails for a long time for whatever reason. So we can slow down Telus to improve the delivery rate and sort of send some Telus and send some Shaw, send some more Telus, send some Gmail, and it let us refine our approach to email delivery. Um, I know that commercial services like SendGrid let you do things like this, sort of more advanced uh, delivery techniques based on uh, the results with uh, individual domain deliveries, uh, and, and this data let us sort of refine our approach so we could land emails faster and in a more timely way, particularly for issue or time-sensitive emails. Um, now, we, uh, over the course of the campaign, obviously, our, um, our, donation, uh, our, our donations grew significantly. Um, and uh, one of the things that we uh, also went into testing for was uh, A-B testing. Um, I found that actually the original list that we brainstormed about a year ago, and we brainstormed probably 250 uh, different parameters that we can test in an email. Big font versus small font, gray versus black type, large button versus small button for donate, and on and on and on. And we, we tested about a third of them over the course of the campaign, but we, we assumed nothing. We took everything that we'd done over the last three or four years and said, let's not make any assumptions about what works and what doesn't. Let's test every single thing. And we learned a fair bit. We learned that um, with certain audiences, with, with audiences we identify as younger, profanity worked. Putting a swear word in an email subject line massively increased the open rate. With older folks, if you're sending to Comox and retirement communities, not so much. Um, 
ugly emails work. They format better on phones. They get held up less in spam filters. Like, like the, the, and they drive me crazy because I'm a graphic design guy, but <laughs> they work better. They get higher open rates and higher conversion rates. And we started to test every single thing, whether or not to use a semicolon at the end of your subject line, whether to address it personally, dear Michael, or just, hey, um, we, we literally tested every parameter we could come up with and started to slowly see incremental results. Um, it's worth saying that results will vary. We, we did a lot of reading. What, did, what do American campaigns do? What do not-for-profits do? What's Amnesty International doing? What's, what's everybody else doing? Um, and different people have different results. Some of our in-house testing results really didn't match up with other folks' results. Uh, and for that reason, it's worth testing everything. Um, and not assuming that sort of best practices that you read are necessarily going to work. Um, by the end of the campaign, we raised just shy of $700,000 online during the 28 days, and our average donation was about $100. Um, we, we, you know, one of the analyses that I came across when I was putting the presentation together was looking at different segments of our list and how much they donated. And our stats guy at one point built a fairly complicated formula that I don't much understand, but he basically tried to come up with based on demographics, where you live, how old we think you are, and a few other things that we sort of randomly knew about people, how much to ask for. And we found that, again, that improved the conversion rate a lot. Asking a donor who'd previously given $500 to give 20 bucks, you know, I think anyone who works in fundraising is gonna tell you that's not very smart. Same with a new donor, you don't wanna ask a brand new donor for $1,000, they're gonna think you're kinda of crazy. Uh, and by starting to use more sophisticated prediction techniques to come up with uh, numbers, like we found that, um, for example, you should ask for higher dollar amounts from people who live in liberal held seats. Not quite sure why that is, but our testing found that they donated a little bit more. Uh, but those sort of insights led us to refine our online fundraising techniques and maximize our individual donations over the course of the campaign. Now the lesson here, and I'm sure you've heard it in other lectures, test everything, then test it again, and keep testing. Uh, we, we didn't stop from day one until day 28 of the campaign. We learned something every single time we went out, and, uh, and it really, it, it truly did boost uh, the online fundraising and conversion efforts. Sorry. Thank you. So moving on to the, sort of the next lesson here. So campaigns are big, uh, provincial campaigns in particular. They're pretty sizable enterprises. There are dozens of people working in the central campaign, uh, hundreds if not thousands working in individual uh, riding level campaigns across the province. There's lots of people volunteering their time and helping out. And there's a whole lot of units and a whole lot of people with a whole lot of responsibilities. Now, our central campaign in Burnaby had 11 different units, organization, communications, tour and administration, fundraising, and on and on and on. Uh, that's a whole lot of department heads, a whole lot of people who have to coordinate their work. Um, and I'm sure that any of you guys who, like me, work in an office, just love those, you know, everybody in the, uh, those all staff meetings where everybody goes around, you say what you're working on. That's not really the kind of thing you have time for in a campaign. It, the day is far too short to allow for that. Um, now, coordination, obviously, was a major challenge. And... Um, much of our day, day to day, would, as, as I mentioned earlier, revolve around the tour, on the morning policy announcement that the leader would do. And this is a, you know, a photo of the typical kind of circus that you'd see every morning. Um, there was, you know, the tour unit would deal with tech and logistics and hotels. Uh, you know, policy would write the announcement. Media would write the press release and the speaking notes. Um, uh, you know, quick response would get talking points and pushback ready. Uh, we'd have to brief our candidates. We'd need to generate share graphics for Facebook, get the video hit done. We'd need to write a fundraiser to go out later that day, you know, and so on and so on. Like dozens of people involved in coordinating dozens of things. Um, I, I, for what it's worth, I would say we were successful in broad strokes, but not as much on the digital front. And I think something that's useful in this is, um, has anyone read the, the report that Communicopia puts out every year, talking about the, uh, um, the evolution of digital teams? It's friggin' gold is what it is. It is. If there's something better than gold, platinum, that's what it is. It's fantastic. What's it called? Um, it's, called it's called the Report on Digital Teams. If you Google Communicopia Digital Teams, you'll find it. They've done this for several years now, so they sort of track, they do a survey and track every year the responses. And what they're looking to do is compile a bit of a, a knowledge base on how digital teams are structured in the not-for-profit world. Um, and, and sort of trying to, essentially trying to write the book on this because this is a pretty new area for a lot of not-for-profits. I mean, people might have been doing it for five years, but you know, communications and fundraising have been around for ages. Digital is a pretty new field. And the reason I refer to this is that we started to see over the course of the campaign that we were suffering from siloed departments. And this is something I saw in the Communicopia report both before and after the election. 
Essentially, the problem was this. The folks who wrote the talking points were separate from the folks who wrote the online content or the separate from the folks who wrote the fundraising email. Different departments with different department heads and different strategic goals during the campaign. And in a fast-moving campaign where you're repeating everything once every 24 hours, um, it's tough to play catch-up. And one of the problems that we faced was exactly this, that you know, making sure that fundraising was briefed on the issue of the day in time to get a, a, a timely fundraising email out that didn't trample on top of another email that didn't trample on top of another update. Um, it got done eventually, but this breakdown in units where you have different units with different responsibilities proved to be a bit of a challenge for us. Um, and it, it also extended into data siloing, which sort of was something we, we realized was happening partway through the campaign. And that is, I mean, if you've been counting, I've mentioned a couple of different databases, and I'm going to add a couple more. So we had, you know, NDP vote in the field office. We had the cross-tab analytics in, uh, at the central campaign. Uh, we had Civi CRM that handles all of our fundraising. Uh, we have our website, which runs Drupal web forms for data collection. And we had a predictive dialer, an automatic dialing program that uh, a lot of our phone canvassers used. Um, so, th I mean, these are five systems, and there's a couple more on top of this, all of which have to talk to each other, which is a bit of a daunting challenge. And initially, we just assumed, well, we've got a data team, Dan Pollock's folks, like, okay, Dan, make Civi go to the predictive dialer and make crosstabs go to the website. Like, we just assumed, fix it. But the reality was that we learned, like, this was the most data-intensive campaign we've ever run, uh, and we want to take things further. And what we learned very quickly was that without specific plans, and, and never mind APIs, but even plans in terms of human workflow, that you quickly get bogged down in too much information. Yet another, you know, sign up for an event web form that needs to get merged into the email list and another follow-up email sent out. Like, you quickly get bogged down in keeping track of so many pieces of data from so many lists and so many media uh, that it quickly gets overwhelming. And uh, there was a major lesson for us in this. Now, ironically, and we'd read this before the election and it didn't become clear till afterwards, Obama 08 ran into exactly the same problem. Um, I only know of four of the databases they used. There, I'm told there were more, but they used uh, VAN for voter contact, Blue State Digital for, uh, for fundraising. They used a web-based predictive dialer system for volunteers across the province. And they, during the primaries, they used a system called Build the Hope. None of these systems talked to each other on a billion-dollar campaign. And we had, sorry, we had exactly the same challenge, which was how do we get these divergent systems to talk to each other? You know, in, in other campaigns I've worked on, how do I get MailChimp to talk to my voter contact database to talk to my phone bank? Like moving the information back and forth, making sure that, you know, my canvasser on the doorstep knows that yesterday the person at this house signed our make a plan to vote uh, tool is a bit of a challenge, moving that much data around to that many places across the province. And so this was one of the major lessons for us out of that campaign, that it's great to build data tools and it's great, great to bring more tools in, but breaking down silos in advance, both human silos and digital silos, is crucial and you have to plan ahead to do that. And I know that as folks start to look at future campaigns and the 2017 provincial election, this is gonna be one of the major digital challenges we have, is how do we break down both the departmental units as well as the digital divide. And it's, it's a lot easier to say, great, we'll write an API, than it is to actually go and write an API for two systems to talk to each other. Um, and I know that friends of mine who work in the not-for-profit world are having a lot of the same discussions. How do I get my email program to talk to my social graph tracking to talk to my fundraising database? They're all different with different unit heads, and it's a, it's a tough challenge to overcome. So following the campaign, I mean, there was a lot of talk about polling. I had more polling conversations than I care to admit. And, you know, between BC, Manitoba, Ontario, Alberta, like, there's a growing consensus that polling is maybe in a bit of trouble, that things are changing fast. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about polling, but it, it's tough, it, it's, it's tough not to. It's interesting stuff, it's sexy, it's kind of cool that you can get, you know, nightly samples. Um, not a ton of people have seen this, although it's been semi-public. This is, this is our internal tracking from the, the election. This was every night we dialed 100 people's houses and asked them how they were going to vote. And this is sort of what the results look like. Um, the reason I bring this up is that those two, those two lines at the top, the orange line, which was the NDP, and the red line for the Liberals, were sort of, that was the key unit we tracked every night. And the answer to the question, if the election were held today, who would you vote for? Now, we all know what happened. Our polling at the end said there was a sizable gap, you know, four points. The public domain poll said there was a six point gap. Everybody thought they knew it was gonna happen on Sunday before the election. Of course, the results were very, very different. But this wasn't the only metric that we were tracking. 
Um, one of the other things I mentioned earlier is that we were able to track how many supporters we had identified on the doorstep across the province. And we knew towards the end of the campaign that we'd identified about 50% more supporters than the previous election. That seemed like a good sign. We lost the last election by 3,500 votes. You know, the math seemed to add up. And between these two numbers, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that folks are feeling pretty comfortable. But we didn't stop to look at some of the secondary metrics. For example, we didn't ask questions and analyze things like, who, you know, polling question like, who would be the best premier? That answer might have shown something a bit different than this graph, and we might have asked the question, why are these numbers different? Um, we didn't ask the question of, okay, we've identified 50% more supporters than last time, but a lot of those people were identified early in the campaign. Later on, are any of them changing? Have we called any of them back? Are any of the people who we've talked to who said, I'm not sure, I haven't decided yet, are they undecided in coming to us? They decided to vote NDP, or are they voting liberal? We didn't look at some of these secondary metrics. And, you know, I like to think, I'm, I'm not sure what the outcome would have been, of course. It's, it's easy to play hypotheticals around elections. But uh, these secondary metrics would have given some really interesting answers. And we're starting to go back to some of the data we have and, and look at that and look at what might have, might have changed or what we might have learned from analyzing some of these secondary results. And, I mean, this is sort of lesson number five out of the campaign. Don't rely on just one metric. Um, this election, we had, we had two that we, we relied on. We relied on polling, as we always have, and for once we relied on the total number of identified supporters. But we didn't ask deeper questions, like how are, those, how are, how are things changing? What's a second question we can ask to verify these results? Um, don't use a single data point to evaluate how you're doing. I remember coming to a, a web analytics seminar here uh, about eight months ago, I, I can't remember. Uh, we were, they were talking about uh, how to interpret Google Analytics results. And the first thing he said was, total number of visitors to our website, please, for the love of God, ignore that number. It doesn't mean anything. And it's kind of true. Um, we learned very quickly that a one-dimensional analysis of what's going on in the election is a very shallow representation of what's really going on in a complicated environment. And so, too, in any other project, we don't want to take, uh, we don't analyze fundraising results based on one metric. We might do well in the dollars, but if we have a small number of donors, the long-term health of our donor base might not be great. And you know, that was one of the key lessons for us, is to look at secondary metrics to, A, question whether your data is correct, because data could be wrong, and B, to make sure that you're getting the full picture of what's actually going on. So another tool that we introduced during the campaign was called micro-targeting. Um, micro-targeting is uh, a tool that originated in direct marketing, in, in uh, telemarketing, in, uh, in direct mail marketing, you know, those catalogs your parents used to get when you were kids the, uh, for consumers direct, those sort of things. Um, the tools are developed by marketers to uh, target mailings, to mail into households in parts of the country that are statistically likely to buy products through mail order. And they did this based on previous sales and widely available demographic information from the census. So things like income, do you own a car, do you own or rent your house, uh, number of kids, just widely available demographic data. This was developed in the 1980s and 1990s. And in the early 2000s, we started to see this emerge in American elections, particularly pioneered by the Republicans. They started to say, what commercial data can we use and what demographic data can we use to not poll, not take a 2,000 person sample, but take the entire voters list, uh, in this case for the United States, and tag everybody as really likely to vote for us, less likely or not all, at all likely. It's a bit of predicting the future. And the goal isn't to figure out how people are, will vote, but to prioritize how you contact them and how you communicate with them. So we pioneered this in BC for the first time. And um, the tool was a relatively late addition to the campaign. And the goal was to give local campaigns a tool to prioritize voter contact. Knocking on doors is incredibly labor intensive. It takes a long time. I don't know how many of you guys have gone door knocking, but when I go out, like you knock for an hour, you find two people at home. It takes a lot of walking. Uh, it's really good for the gut, uh, but um, uh, for the waistline, but it, it's really labor intensive. And anything you can do to maximize your volunteers' time it is a real benefit. So we deployed this system. It was, it was a bit of a test. We didn't know what would happen. We didn't know how accurate it would be. Uh, this hasn't been widely used in Canada yet, but in the United States, it had been used by the Obama folks, by the Bush folks to some effect, and we thought, let's give it a try. Let's run an experiment. So we rolled it out relatively close to the elections, and we did a bunch of training with, with local volunteers and local campaign staff. And we, we were able to get it out in the field, but what we weren't able to do was to take the time to train people 
test it in the field, and then take those results back and refine the tool. This was a, a prototype, essentially. And what that meant was that for a lot of campaigns, they were already out actively working. They, were, they had a campaign plan, they were already canvassing, their candidate was out doing events. And they weren't able to integrate it as fully, and more importantly, we weren't able to integrate their feedback to refine the product, both the software and the data they were getting, to make sure that it was working for them out on the doorstep with the volunteers in the phone bank, that sort of thing. Um, now, the long and the short of it is, um, the data shows that the micro-targeting tool did work. It relatively effectively predicted whether somebody was more or less likely to vote NDP. That said, what happened was we had a lot of frustrations from folks out in the field because we didn't have that time to go through an iterative cycle of uh, train, deploy, test, and refine so we can make the tool better over time. Um, and the result, like I say, was a fair bit of frustration. I think um, we found that people's uh, expectations of the product were not in line with what it was meant to deliver. Uh, I think people often look for uh, a magic tool that will solve a problem. And I, I don't think this is much different uh, from my experience working in the not-for-profit world, where you buy a, a new fundraising product, a new outreach product, and you, it's supposed to solve all these things. But at the end of the day, it's only as good as your ability to integrate it, to refine end-user feedback, and to, make it, and to train people to use it effectively. And what we learned very quickly was that you know, even though we handed uh, campaign staff what in principle was a, a Lamborghini data system, uh, it was driven a bit like a K car in some cases. It wasn't, you know, an unsophisticated approach to a sophisticated tool will not return the best results. And one of the key lessons for us here was that you need to start early, you need to train your end users, and you need to integrate their feedback because they're the ones using it day to day. These, and, you know, it, both in the not for profit world and in the political campaign world, most of our end users aren't experts. They're not highly technical people, they're not even full-time digital campaigners, they're volunteers, and you need to build to your end user audience and make sure that they can effectively use it in the field. Now, um, with that, I mean, that comes to the end of the formal part of my talk. Um, I think it's fair to say that despite the loss, I'm really proud of what I did and what my colleagues did in the campaign. And I'm hoping that, you know, through starting to talk about some of this stuff through, with folks like you, uh, to start to lay out some of the work that we did, uh, lay out the results, and start to look at uh, the entrails, if you will, that we can start to glean some lessons from what happened. Um, a lot of work was done, some of it good, some of it not, but I think there's a whole lot of lessons, uh, both for advocacy campaigners, for folks in the not-for-profit world, and for political folks. And I'm hoping that, you know, together we can start to, uh, to figure out what worked, what didn't, and what we're all going to do on, uh, on future campaigns. So with that, uh, I mean, just to sum up, you know, uh, in terms of lessons, uh, on the digital uh, campaigning front, speed matters. When you're building tools, be adaptive. Perfect isn't the enemy of good. Uh, when you're out engaging people, test everything and then retest everything. Um, in both human and digital, break down silos and divisions between systems, both your people and your systems. Don't rely on just one metric when you're analyzing your results. Start early, train your people, and integrate their feedback, and you'll be better tools. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions or if you guys want to chat. Thanks so much. Right, thank you. I've got a question. Yes, please, go ahead. Just shout things out or raise your hand or I don't know. How, how does this normally work? No, no, totally. Shout it out and give this with me back a quick summary of the question. Okay. Got it. Uh, my question is uh, concerning social media, if you guys had a, a, an official policy concerning how to handle negative comments. In terms of like negative comments on our Facebook page or Twitter feedback, that sort of yeah. thing? Um, for the most part, we ignored it. Um, I know on Facebook, sort of our standing policy was uh, anything goes as long as it's not hateful or illegal. So, um, you know, if not everybody's going to agree with you. We accept that. We don't want to delete things just because they don't agree with us. <laughs> But, you know, if it crosses the line of, of hate or some other sort of legally questionable comment, uh, you know, th those we, we would erase. But beyond that, um, we would engage as positively as we could. We t our staff tended not to really engage with really cranky folks. That, like, those discussions tended not to be very positive. Um, but we really did try to answer every comment, post, or question that, was, uh, that wasn't a troll, if you will. Um, but, yeah, we more or less left it alone unless it was hate. I actually have a comment on that. Um, mm -hmm. Because I was the um, office organizer in Oak Bay Gordon Head, and one of the hats I wore was social media manager. And we were coming up with our social media policies on the fly, more or less. 
But because we were getting some good successes, at least what we interpreted to be some good metrics, we actually had all the South Island campaigns kind of like calling in to our campaign and we were calling out to them on sort of best practices, what to do, what not to do. And it was a lot of fun. Um, but that said, there wasn't any kind of repository of what we'd learned or how we could kind of spread out our learning into the wider world, which, you know, in the situation, I, I felt was, was a missing piece. But, you know, our interpretation of that question was exactly like you said, is, is it hateful? Is it, you know, yeah. It, still we moderated answer. the discussions based on, like we would, we would look at the discussion and see not is it politically viable, but is it like something that would be said in public? If it's a viable question, would you respond to the question? Often, yeah, very much. And the, our campaign manager was very active about getting on Facebook and directly responding to legitimate questions, for sure. We used Hootsuite Enterprise to sort of manage our workflow centrally because there were a huge number of inquiries coming in. But yeah, we tried to answer every question. Occasionally, we take things offline on 140 characters on quite enough to explain the ins and outs of transportation policy or what have you. But uh, yeah, we did. Tr we tried to answer everything we could. But we didn't actually. We didn't have Hootsuite in our office until we'd installed it because we we're like, oh shoot, how do we do this? We need Hootsuite. So we learned that really quickly. Yeah. But we did have a really cool tool, which was the platform document that was online. It was word searchable, and you could, you know, you could be talking or tweeting with somebody and pull it up and find the section of the platform that direct, directly related to their issue. So having that resource was super valuable. I saw a question over here. Yeah, actually, well, question and comment, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, part of any metrics, because I went through a discussion uh, at SFU on this very issue about polling and metrics and all mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And I guess one, one piece of reassurance was that uh, uh, most of the pollers would agree with your numbers almost, and what actually may have happened is people changed their mind in the 24 to 48 hours before the polling, before they vote. So your numbers could have been. Um, but the second part, and I guess it's uh, to do with your micro-targeting as well. Um, Mario Consecutive at this point was, it's harder to do if you're in Canada because you only vote every four years. When you use micro-targeting and polling in the U.S., it's much more accurate because they're in constant election mode. So they're either voting for a congressman or, the, or for the House of Representatives or the presidential vote or something like that. So they're constantly in that, so you, it's easier to point to. So I can see why it would work so. Yeah, so the, the two comments were um, in reverse order. One, that there's more elections in the state, so some of these tools work better. Yeah. And fair enough, I mean, they're voting for a house of cards every you know, couple of months down there, it yeah. seems. Uh, but uh, we were a bit of a, an experiment. We haven't done this in Canada. The data sets were different, um, and we, were, we wanted to see how it worked. Uh, and we, some things worked, some things didn't, but we learned a lot through the process. Um, and you made the point that people change their minds um, somewhat uh, in terms of polling results. Uh, someone on my team made the comment mid-campaign, and it turned out to be very prophetic, that uh, a poll is a snapshot in time of what was happening yesterday, not a predictor of the future. Michael, can you maybe even add something to it about the difference between Canada and the U.S. in terms of what data they have on their voters? Because we have yeah. a lot more legislation. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, so Kylo's comment was that there's a lot more data available in the U.S. Um, for you guys who don't know, uh, American voters lists include tons more information. They include gender and phone numbers and household, like you own your house and a whole bunch of other metrics that I don't know about, uh, as well as what party you're registered. Are you a Democrat, and Independent, or Republican? Um, these are things we don't have in Canada. Uh, they also have, which drives me and a ton of other people crazy, whether you voted in the last election, which is simply not available in this country anywhere, as far as I know. Um, and you know, amidst the debate that we've all seen going on about low voter turnout, how do we improve that, blah, blah, blah. Well, a great start would be knowing, first off, who doesn't vote, and maybe we can convince those people to vote. That might be a start, <laughs> but I'm just saying. Uh, yes, in the back corner. Uh, just a comment on something you said earlier. You said that you guys were doing polling uh, in household every night. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, before that, in your presentation, you also said that you were trying to set up databases for all 85 writings. Why were you doing that when only like 20 writings in the province are competitive? And in the 100 that you call every night, were you writing specific or no? So the question was, um, why do we set up databases in 85 constituencies when only a small number are competitive seats? And the second part was, um, 
around uh, 100 people, was that targeted, like 100 people per night for polling, was that targeted on specific uh, constituencies? So on the polling, uh, it was a province-wide sample, and um, this was a bit of a controversy after the election. The reason we did a province-wide tracking poll, uh, as opposed to in other elections, people look at sort of the, the key seats that decide the election. Some seats will sort of more or less always be NDP, some will always be Liberal. What do the ones in the middle do? The reason we chose not to do that was looking at the last Ontario, Manitoba, and Alberta elections, where there were major swings in the polls, where polling was wonky in a few cases. We didn't want to have a poll that was like, oh my god, we're 20 points up, when like Angus Reid on TV every night is like, the NDP are behind by six. We wanted to kind of validate what we were getting. We wanted the instant data, but we wanted to kind of get every week when the public polls came out, something that said, okay, we're not totally crazy. And at the end of the election, like that, that last weekend, our internal results and the ones, the public domain results basically showed the same thing. So we weren't that afraid that they were wrong. But as was pointed out, those were the results two days before the election, not on election day. Um, in terms of the databases, uh, we encouraged everybody to do voter contact. Uh, back in 2012, we won a by-election in Chilliwack, which hasn't really been a really NDP part of British Columbia. Um, and when we went in to run that campaign, we had no history on supporters. We had no list of people who had said they voted NDP, list of volunteers, none of that stuff. And the reason that we encourage both really safe seats and also seats that don't have a great chance of winning, of collecting that information and building those lists, is if we go back next election and we want to campaign harder there, we'll start with a list of volunteers. That's a great, we'll start with a list of, um, you know, households that took a lawn sign. And that's a really great starting point. So it may not help us immediately, but it's about long-term growth. Uh, there was a question in the back corner that I missed, and then uh, there and there. My question was going to be, why are you not for your own organization tracking voters? And you're kind of getting there. You're, you're building up a, over 20 years or 30 years. So you, the technology's there that you can start trending across elections and start sifting these voters. So, uh, are you looking at establishing your own voter list? The question was why we're not tracking voters. Um, Elections BC provides the registered voters list. The real goal that we want is the list of people who voted in the last election. Um, we, we don't know who votes. We have no way of finding that out. It's theoretically available, but you'd have to copy it off paper by hand. And this is a bit silly in an age where everything is in a database or a spreadsheet. And that's one of the challenges we face. It's hard to engage people who don't vote when we don't even know who they are and Elections BC and Elections Canada aren't helping us find out who they are. Well, you know, I've done a fair amount of door knocking. Mm -hmm. People will tell you whether you're voting or not quite often. People will tell you, but in post-election polls, 85% of people tell you they voted in the last election. The data proves otherwise. Um, yes? Um, I had a question about the data that you gathered about, from email fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious uh, who it was who was in charge of the BC and DPC email fundraising in the last um, if all of that information sort of lives somewhere that will be used to inform um, you know, future efforts or that people will come to findings or the gap in this website will be able to learn things from that. Um. Yes, it's tracked and recorded. I mean, whether how widely it'll be available, I, I don't know, but maybe chat with me afterwards and we can talk about that. Uh, there was a question over here. Chris. When you're taking uh, like polling and polling like cold calls, how do you account for people that say aren't willing to answer cold calls in your data? Um, so you're talking about like, I call up like, hey, Chris, I'm a volunteer calling for the NDP, and you're like, hey, I don't want to tell you, if you call who I'm supporting. Like So, I mean, I guess, sorry, there's two pieces of this. The question was, how do you deal with not enough responses, essentially, when you're phoning? Um, on the voter contact side, when we're calling individual people and saying, like, hey, are you going to vote? Are you going to vote NDP? Um, we don't worry about that. People who don't say, well, there's nothing we can do. They're not going to tell us how they're going to vote or if they're going to vote or anything else. And we just move on. There's a lot of other people to contact, and you can never talk to every voter. Um, when polling companies do it, they move on because they're not going to get an answer, but they call more people than they need and make sure that um, their sample size matches up demographically with census data. So they have enough, you know, fifty dollars to $80,000 annual income households, that they have enough men, enough women, enough 18 to 24 year olds, enough 65 to whatever year olds. Uh, they, they do that after the fact. So they overcall and then make sure their sample is representative. Uh, yes. Um, and then. Well, two questions, if that's not cheating. 
Uh, <laughs> first, it's like uh, on the micro targeting. Uh, so I worked at the, like the Polkad out in uh, Maple Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, so some idea of what the experience is there in terms of how we did this. So we've got the micro targeting numbers, but mm -hmm. curious to know how was that meant to? What, what's your take on how that's sort of meant to translate to the on the ground work? We might get given a call and be like, well, there are a lot of persuadable people, in, but I'm quite general, and even an individual phone is quite large. Um, my second question is more overall. Um, what are your feelings about, say, the overall role of like, digital communication, so social media and, and email, um, as a part of sort of overall communications, including sort of media relations or traditional communications? Do you see the role of digital increasing in future? Do you think the MVP sort of balance the right? Um, so the two questions were, what do, you, what do I see the role of digital communications and campaigns sort of going forward, and I guess as they stand right now, and the first part was sort of how did micro-targeting work or how was it meant to work? So quickly on micro-targeting, the theory was that you could use demographics uh, and polling data to very roughly predict whether someone was more or less likely to vote for you. It's not a science, like if it were, we would do elections this way and no one would have to vote. It's clearly not a science. It's math and statistics and it's a guess, it's an educated guess. And the theory is, just like in the direct marketing world, if I'm sending you a catalog and going, hey, buy my awesome Chinaware, uh, I'm hoping that you're gonna do that. And there's no guarantees, but I can, if I know a bit about the people who buy my fine China products, I might be able to find other people that share, you know, maybe more women buy them or more, uh, you know, house owning, two car driving, whatever. Um, that doesn't guarantee you're going to buy my product in much the same way it doesn't guarantee you're going to vote for me. But it gives me a small advantage, a small uh, ability to target. And that's really what the strategy was. It was the same in the States. There are so many voters. You have, you know, the better part of two million people you want to attempt to reach. You want to be a little bit more efficient because you're never going to talk to all of them. And that, that was the purpose of the tool. Um, I think the question on digital campaigning was great, and I'll do my best to answer this. And the question was, what do I see the role of digital campaigning doing? I spent a lot of time before the election telling candidates, Facebook and Twitter do not win elections, but they can lose them for you. <laughs> digital campaigning has become a mainstay. Um, having a website, having a social media presence is a pretty well accepted part of campaigning, of marketing in general. If I can't find you on your business on Google Maps, uh, I'm gonna look somewhere else, right? When I Google gas station nearby, I need you to come up or I'm not gonna visit you. So too in the campaign universe. Um, most voters are not particularly engaged. Uh, the myth of the voter who sits down and reads the platform and evaluates different things, it, it's just that, it's a myth and it doesn't happen. That said, what I view those tools as, and I think the same translates over to the not-for-profit and the advocacy campaign world, is these are not about getting your message out to the general public. What they are about is connecting with highly engaged people, people who can become volunteers, who can become online advocates, who can become activists, donors, members, those sort of things. And for us, we, we tailored our online communications to accomplish two things. One was to provide our candidates with lots of great content to share so that they didn't have to come up with their own ideas that might be unfortunately newsworthy and possibly cost them their nomination, something we don't want. But more importantly, to be appealing to the kinds of folks who want to get involved, who want to be a volunteer, who might want to donate, who want to be more actively engaged. That's a very small segment of voters, but it's really important to our campaigns. And for, I'd argue for anyone who works in a not-for-profit or advocacy role, those are really valuable people, the people who are actually really engaged with the organization. And I think that's who you're campaigning to in the online world. That's not, like I say, you won't win or lose an election online, maybe lose it, but you won't win it online but you will grow your base, you'll grow your supporters, you'll grow your volunteers, and there is huge value to that. That shouldn't be discounted. Yeah? So this is just a follow up to the question about polling. Um, in a world where, I, I know I haven't had a uh, landline since 1998, and I know many people are like me, and I know that the um, calling strategies are geared towards landlines. So, how are you going to deal with that? What's the lesson that we learned there? So, sorry, just when you asked your question, you said, in a world where I just watched the movie on the weekend that's about a voiceover <laughs> guy who reported that in movies. Sorry, as an aside. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Uh, a lot of pollsters now don't phone off a predetermined list. They use random digit dialing and then ask people for their postal code to determine their geography. Um, I get calls on my cell phone randomly sometimes. That's how they can overcome that problem and reach the cell phone audience. Yes? I'm trying to understand something. Mm -hmm. I thought I heard you say that you 
only did province-wide polling. So that means that you could never directly overlay your polling data onto your geographic or demographic or voter ID or donation data there. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes and no. During the campaign, uh, we did a nightly sample and we, did, we took a lot, the previous four days to give us a running number of where we were trending. That was never meant to be overlaid with other data. Before the election, we did other research, much larger sample sizes, that we did overlay on that data. That was part of our micro-targeting program, and that's how we, that's how we overlaid some of that, because you can't do that with 100 people a night. You need thousands of responses to be able to, to overlay that data. So that's how we did it. We did it with a, a pre-election snapshot, um, not the nightly tracking. But the point is that you never really knew what was happening in specific constituencies. You couldn't say, oh, we are now losing constituency X, but winning constituency Y. No, and to be fair, it's a, it's a problem that we're not sure how to solve, and we're going to have to work with some people to figure it out. The challenge is this. We tried to do some riding level pollings, and in, you know, we tried to pick a certain constituencies and say, where are the NDP and the Liberals and the Greens at in, I don't know, Point Grey or Oak Bay or wherever? And the problem is, with rapidly diminishing landline use, it's really hard to geographically target. You have to make more and more and more and more phone calls to get enough of a sample size to be statistically valid particularly in that small of a universe. There are, there are between 35 and 65,000 people in one constituency, which sounds like a lot until you realize that you don't want kids, you need a, a, a representative sample, and you need to reach enough of them in a short, amount, a short enough period of time. And we tried that, and it just became a daunting challenge that we couldn't get enough responses to give us the valid data. Um, and so we went a different direction to try and give us a, an overall picture of what was happening in the province, because we just we couldn't make it happen. Well, I remember reading, he may have been lying, I don't know, but there was some interview with the liberal poster, and he claimed that they were polling in 30 designated constituencies every day. And I hear that his business is booming, having won the election now. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the liberals did, to be perfectly honest. Uh, you know, this is a question we're grappling with. I know folks in a lot of other provinces and nationally from all the parties are grappling with. Um, opinion research is changing. Uh, the rules that came in uh, a year ago around interactive voice response, where you have to go, hi, I'm calling from such and such research. Here's my address, here's my phone number. You know, like, that's making it really hard to do um, the automated prompt polling. It's changed, the industry's changing really, really quickly, and I think a lot of people are trying to keep up with what works. Um, I wish I had the answers, the election might have been different if we did, but uh, all I can say is, uh, People are trying new things, and it's through experimentation that we'll figure out what might work next time. Hey, come on, uh, are there any other questions from folks, sorry, who haven't asked, and then I'll come back to you? All right, last question, yeah. it's yours. Okay, I'll give a second poll, but um, from other pollsters, they have actually said that that methodology has never been published by the liberal and has never been validated, so that may not actually be true. Um, and, that, and to your point, um, I think every part is struggling with that just too much data in such a short amount of time and so much work to get that. And you probably know that already from the very metrics that you have, roughly where you're competitive and where you're not. Yeah. That was an excellent comment. The, the first thing that Lawrence said, Lawrence, right? Yeah. Lawrence said was, um, you know, the liberal pollster sort of hasn't been validated. Like, yeah, I don't know who the fellow is, but he clearly wants a lot of work. And if I want an election, I'd probably do the same thing as him and say, hey, look, I did it. Come hire me. But you made an excellent point, and I want, to, I want to pick up on this as the last comment of the day. You said that we had a lot of data coming in, and that's true. We had more raw data coming in from online web forms, from sign-ups, from event sign-ins, from voter contact, from uh, interactive voice response than we've ever had before. And increasingly, in campaigns, in the not-for-profit world, in, uh, in the corporate world, we're all collecting more raw data more quickly than we ever have before, and it's only getting faster and larger volume. And one of the challenges that we have that us and a lot of other organizations are dealing with and a challenge we're trying to figure out how to address is how do we prioritize and effectively use the massive amount of information that we're collecting, personal, um, aggregate, and, and otherwise. Uh, some of it's valuable, some of it's not, and sifting the wheat from the chaff and figuring out how to act on it and how to move it from system to system are crucial challenges that everybody is facing now. And I think a whole lot of groups, particularly folks like you know, the small and not-for-profit world like us and, and like a lot of you guys are trying to figure out how do we do this with one or two staff and a huge amount of information coming in. And I hope that discussions like this can be a part of how we all figure that out together because I don't think any of us have the entire answer, but 
I think we'll figure it out together. Once again, thanks for coming out tonight. Fab, thank you. Well, that was kind of amazing. But thank you so much for coming and like doing this. Clearly, they want to pick your brains for hours and hours. <laughs> we could do this as a monthly thing. Like, we can go pretty deep on this. <laughs>